that you with your double Wi-Fi. Oh my God! Then they can't, oh. they can't interact. Okay. <laughs> All righty. We're back in the record. This is the Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for May 23rd, 2017. Zoning calendar, new cases, item number one, 2015 BC, 461 Avenue X, the Bro Brooklyn. Mr. Lovkovitz. Hi, good afternoon. Um, Alexander Lefkowitz on behalf of the applicant for 61 Avenue X. Um, I understand that uh, we had another issue this time around with sending the notices. Uh, we would like to request uh, an adjournment, obviously. Now, um, wasn't, it wasn't the fault of my client. So if possible, if we can get a, a date as soon as possible that's available to the board. And uh, we'll make sure that we'll be fully prepped for the next appearance. Right, but I don't. I don't understand what your problem is with giving the proper notice. Do you Do you understand what the rules are? You have to notify neighbors with uh, it. I fully, I fully understand. Uh, there was an, there was an issue on our end. Um, we understand that we need. To, we understand the way it has to be done. We understand the way that uh, it has to be done with the proper amount of time in advance, um, and. Uh, Okay. That's it's not going to be an issue anymore. Okay. There's not. I mean, our calendar is really full until the end of July, right? Yeah. And if, it's, if any possible way to to get us a date as soon as possible. As soon as possible is July 25th. Okay. Do, you have, do you have maybe available the week prior to that? No. Right? Didn't we just? Yeah. yeah. The, this, the rest. The is yeah. July 25th is the earliest. We've already po postponed this for failure to give notice once before. That was in March. No, I understand. So, you uh, know. If there's any way to fit us into July 13th date. There, you know. there isn't. So July 25th is the earliest we can do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. Okay. And notice just has to be given. It needs to be given in 20, right. 20 days in advance of the hearing. All right, All right thank you. Okay. Okay, the next case is for calling <coughs> item number three, 2016 42, <coughs> 1671 East 29th Street, Brooklyn. Hello, Eric Palatnik. Thank you for hearing this application before the others. We did review your, attend your review session yesterday, and uh, you had two questions about substantive questions, and then you had a comment about the uh, a letter from a property owner. Uh, the first question was you were talking about the, uh, the survey and the, the yards at being at four foot nine and nine feet. Uh, mm -hmm. We did correct the plans overnight. We'll submit them after the hearing. Uh, the house is slightly irregular, and some of the siding is thicker in some points than in others. So that inch discrepancy that you're seeing is due to the house changing configuration as it goes through. But the survey is what controls. Right, right? and we are changing. The survey is eight foot nine and three foot nine, and we're changing the plans to match the survey. It's three point nine. Three, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. So that's nine. the other yes. thing. That's if you're going to convert to inches, then yes. make sure it's inches. It's in inches. Right. We'll take care of that, okay. and the architect actually already made that that note. Uh, he also put a note on the plans to show that the uh, chimneys are permitted obstruction. Okay, good. Uh, with respect to the neighbor's window, uh, the neighbor's uh, comments, I'm sure you've, you've had a chance to take a look at where that neighbor is situated. Uh, he fronts on Quinton Road. Uh, I have a little, I drew a diagram here. Oh, so it's the neighbor with the rear facing yeah. the side. I was trying to be all professionalized today. Uh, so you, now that you understand where he is situated, uh, he had a question about the, the air conditioning units. Our client has agreed, and we'll show you that on the plan, to place those units 25 feet away from their property line, basically in this, almost in the center of our property, up against the back of the property, uh, and with, so up against the commercial portion, where the commercial butts us at the rear. Uh, they also had questions about the kitchen exhaust. So it's 25 feet from the property 20, line. It'll be 25 feet from the property. It's from the side you know, line. AC units will be located 20, excuse me, 20 feet from the side property line. 20 feet. 20 feet from, from side the side property line. line. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Which side is that? That's from the neighbor's the, side, yeah, whatever side they're on. If you're looking, I guess it'd be adjacent to lot 45. Does that make sense? I don't have these lot 45. I don't There's have these 47 on the me. corner and 45. We'll describe in. it in our narrative. Okay. I just don't have it open in front of me. It's but we'll be 20 feet from yeah. his property line. Okay. <laughs> and the other comment that was made was the kitchen exhaust. The neighbor was concerned about the exhaust. Our kitchen is on the other side of the property. It's not on that neighbor's side. Uh, and you have the plans to show that. And we'll include that in our next submission. Uh, the kitchen exhaust is on the other side. Right. And the, the adjacent neighbor was concerned that we're putting a big window that's going to face them and asked if we could put up a fence. Our client was not planning on putting up any fencing. Uh, he's, he's fine to put it? I don't know. Our client is not planning on putting up any fencing. The okay. neighbor had asked, now that we're putting in a window that's facing their yard, they had asked if we could put up fencing. Our clients, yeah. yeah. I didn't think you'd want to get involved, but uh, our client Sometimes doesn't know. fences build good neighbors? Yeah, it's whatever they decide amongst themselves, okay. but uh, yeah. we're not uh, proposing that to the board. So we will revise the plans to reflect everything that we just said. We actually have them here, but they're handwritten notes, so we want to mm -hmm. get them typed up and uh, whenever you okay. deem so it acceptable. So I'm just looking, so the notes that you're going to be putting on are? The chimney note. The chimney note. And we're going to fix the plans to reflect 8 foot 9 and 3 foot 9 to reflect the survey. 3.9. 3.8.9 and 3.9 feet. Yeah, okay. Not in important. inches, feet. Yes. And if we make it okay. in inches, we'll convert it. Okay. All right. Um, so, are there any speakers on this? Did that neighbor come? Okay. So, all right. Any other comments from commissioners? No. It's too bad that those corrections weren't made because already but well, I have them handwritten you do yeah oh, the board will accept the handwritten notes I just didn't know in the old days the board only accepted handwritten because they hadn't invented CAD graphic systems yet <laughs> 8.9 3.9 and on the drawings uh, there's a note for the chimney if you click it if you click mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 3.9 Oh, I see. It widens to four. It's back probably even bigger than. It widens to go back, so that's why he noted it like that. Mm -hmm. They're signed and sealed. What? Okay. That's, that's all right. That's fine. I'm glad you checked. Thank you. And if you go to drawing. No, of course we're not going to. A O O one has the note for the chimney with the permitted obstruction. And it shows, oh, so the drawings currently show the AC unit. Oh, this is the existing. Sorry, sorry. So that agreement with your neighbor about the air conditioner is your agreement with your neighbor, their agreement with your neighbor. We don't usually get involved in the way AC unit goes, right? So, um. No, but he did put, he did put it on the site plan, too. The very first page he put the AC unit on. Yeah. Put a note. Uh, oh, he did. A O O one. He drew the dimension of 20, twenty feet. Okay, to that's AC fine. Unit. Great. I don't see why we can't accept these plans. They're considered the plans submitted at the hearing, sure, right? Sure. They just get scanned the online. Version, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. I'm sure, the homeowner will be happy. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in that case. Um, I'd like to make, because we talked about this yesterday, it's a very modest proposal and in keeping with the FAR and lot coverage in the neighborhood, and it's only one story through your addition, which is far less than we often see. So, okay. Um, so on that note, I'd like to make a motion to close. Chair Perlmutter? Aye. Vice Chair Chanda? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Otley Brown? Aye. And a motion to grant. Chair Promoter? Aye. Vice Chair Chanda? Aye. Commissioner Montanez? Aye. Commissioner Arthur Brown? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item is item number five, 2016 42 BC, 279 Church Street, Manhattan. Wait a minute. We're taking out of order. We're just sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, Which is, that's the, the last one? Yeah, that's the last one. Good afternoon, Neil Weisbart. Wait, wait, wait.
Okay. Second. Hi. Okay. Found it. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Neil Weisbart on behalf of Lions Den. I attended review session yesterday, and I have a copy of the community board unanimous approval. The second comment was regarding the fire alarm, and we will install the fire alarm as soon as possible on both the second and third floors. Spoke to the architect, said it'll take about a, a week to install, so hopefully have it in within the next right. two weeks. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. The other comment was about all the violations and the what stuff. What about the sprinklers? The sprinklers have been installed and signed off. There have been certain sprinklers that were relocated in, on the second and third floor for over the shower areas. So we understand that DOB will not approve that until we get our BSA approval. I have the architect here to answer any questions about the filings at DOV, if you'd like to ask them some questions. So the sprinklers have been what? They've been installed and signed off, but... Originally, the that stop work order was issued because there was no sprinkler in the building. They installed sprinklers in the hallway and through the entire building. Even the bakery on the first floor had sprinklers installed and was signed off. However, some sprinkler heads were relocated over the shower areas in the PCE, and that cannot be signed off until BSA approves the application. So you said they revised plans. But they're already no. installed, they're just not signed off. Yeah. Correct. That's an important yeah, sort of yeah. distinction. Right. So throughout the PCE. Let me bring up Steve yeah. Lagoda. Sprinklers. You know Sorry. Just a second, yes. the architect will respond. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Shlomo Steve Wagoda. And so uh, we uh, filed, the, the main building sprinkler systems are signed off. We filed uh, uh, a, a separate sprinkler application to amend relocating several sprinkler heads over the showers. That application is in a disapproved status awaiting BSA approval. The examiner will not approve it until uh, um, the BSA gets, uh, we need a copy of a BSA approval to allow sprinklers related to showers that are shown in that plan. Okay. All right. And then, um, so the fire alarm system, though, needs to be, because this is a legalization, we always have the fire alarms installed first and then s and, and inspected. Understood. So especially in a building like this where there really needs to be fire alarms, right? Um, okay. And then... So the, the vacate order, that's something left over? What's yes, that, that was unrelated to the yoga use. It was from a daycare center on the second floor. And I believe because it wasn't sprinklered, so they required 24-hour fire guards. And then the building was fully sprinklered, and the fire guards were removed. We do have to make the vacate order on the fifth floor. That that's, should be rescinded once we follow through with this application. Let me address that. So there's a, oh, a Steve again. A fairly complicated building. The fifth floor is an IMD. It's a loft floor. It's one floor that's an IMD. Fourth floor is residential. Um, our spaces are second and third. We're the yoga studio. The ground floor and cellar are, is a bakery. All of it has been approved. Uh, so the fifth floor um, is occupied by an IMD tenant. And that we're awaiting that tenant to file through his own architect to file some renovations, skylights, whatever uh, the loft board are required. So we're not, you know, we can't control what that first one does. Mm -hmm. I do need to make one important point. The second, this was originally just a legalization for the third floor. The second floor is now in use as well. So this is a full legalization application. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what we're Okay. All right, so then are there any speakers on this? Okay. Uh, both the second yeah, and the third yeah, floor. Yeah. 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 Just what about the sign? The okay. burlesque sign. Yeah, why are you keeping the sign? Landmarks has requested really? that it remain. <laughs> and if we are to change our sign, they want it in that same font. Oh. So I know it's kind of strange, <laughs> but that's what I've been told. You know, we just don't have enough remnants of the old New York, <laughs> right, in terms of signage. Um, okay. So, because we need to wait until we get this fire alarm installed, we can't close this. Um, so, um, you need to come back once fire alarm is installed and, and inspected, or at least scheduled for inspection yeah. by the part, fire department. And fire department typically says, as long as we see you scheduled us for inspection, 
we're okay because now fire department is in the system. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, a few weeks. So that puts us. How long do you think we could have an install and a schedule inspect uh, inspection schedule? So the fire department. Right. So it'll take us a couple of weeks to file. FDNY typically will take one or two or three weeks to approve. Just for the record, there's a fire alarm, partial fire alarm system on the first floor in cellar. Um, that's uh, so, and then uh, once the installation occurs, um, so I would say within a month to two is when I would probably expect uh, FDNY to come and do the inspection. Okay, so that puts us kind of inspection ready at the end of July, right? Right. So then, why don't we say first week of August? How about that? For a continued okay. hearing. Okay. August 8th. August 8th for the continued hearing. And if you can, um, submit your materials on July 19th. And the reason I say if you can, because the this, the sign off from fire department could really be the day before the okay. hearing. Okay. Right. Well, and as long as they have it. The inspection schedule. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. Should have been installed by July 19th, no problem. Installed yeah. and have and filed for an inspection. inspection. Yeah, yeah, we'll give you a record. Yeah, okay. 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 right. Great, thank you. Okay. And, and the burlap sign. You, you leave? leave this location has got a nice history. Okay. So it's land, got landmarks, so it has to stay. Okay, yeah. we Otherwise, heard. This building has some. Love to hear it over <laughs> other sounds, situations. Sounds like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Number two. We done? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Item number two, 2016 4176 BZ 7804, 31st Avenue, Queens. Uh, good afternoon, um, Josh Reinsmith of Ackerman LLP, on, uh, appearing today on behalf of the Islamic Center of Jackson Heights. Um, I'd like to just do a brief overview of the site, the existing building, um, and our proposal, and then I think it'd be helpful to walk through some of the plans to explain the program. I know there were uh, a number of questions regarding that um, layout, um, so I'll cover that and then answer some additional uh, issues that were raised at yesterday's hearing. Um, the, the subject site is located within a R4 district on a relatively narrow corner lot um, at the intersection of 78th Street and 31st Avenue. The um, lot has 89 feet of frontage on um, 78th Street and uh, approximately 38 feet of frontage on um, 31st Avenue. The site's improved with an existing um, two-story basement. Um, building that was originally constructed in the 1930s uh, as a two-family residence. Um, the Islamic Center of Jackson Heights purchased the property in 2001 and converted the basement and um, first floor to uh, house of worship uses, um, which at the time was sufficient um, to accommodate the, the programmatic needs of the, the congregation. Um, they had only had approximately 20 members. Um, since that time, um, over the last 15 to 16 years, um, the South Asian population um, in the immediate vicinity has increased significantly, um, and the congregation now has approximately uh, 200 members. Um, and uh, the existing building, for, for a variety of reasons that were outlined in our application, cannot accommodate this growth currently. Um, the busiest uh, services are on Fridays and on the high holidays. Um, and members of the congregation have to pray outside. Um, speakers are actually set up so the members can um, hear the Imam sermon. Um, and uh, I think that actually contributes to some of the complaints that the uh, neighbors had submitted to the board uh, with respect to noise. Um, in addition, I think it, it um, significantly contributes to some of the pedestrian, pedestrian congestion that had been complained about. Um, the, the applicant, in order to meet the needs of its congregation, proposes to demolish the existing building and construct in uh, a new house of worship um, 
that will have approximately 6,200 square feet of floor area. It'll be three stories in a cellar um, and will be fully compliant with all the bulk regulations but for um, two front yard waivers um, on 31st Avenue. We're going to propose uh, a 10 foot front yard, 15 is required. And 78th Street, we're proposing a five foot front yard, um, the same, uh, another 15 foot uh, yard is required. Um, along our eastern lot line, we're proposing a five foot side yard, um, eight feet is required. And on the property southern lot line, um, we're not providing a front yard, or I'm sorry, a side yard at grade. Um, so that it, uh, actually there's no side yard at all. Um, but above the first story, the building will be set back and comply um, with the yard regulations. Um, as I, I believe was mentioned yesterday at the executive review session, um, the parking requirement under zoning is based off of the largest room of assembly for a house of worship, um, which in this instance would be our cellar level. Um, the, it's actually the cellar level is going to be a combined women's prayer room as well as where um, uh, it will also be a multi-purpose room where wedding ceremonies, um, funeral services are held, um, as well as religious instruction on the weekends. Um, but that is the largest uh, room of assembly. It has 99, uh, a, a 99 occupancy load, which is based off of um, non-fixed seating um, and so it's uh, 15 square feet correct so that would be I'm sorry that's table seating yeah so that's, that's table and chair table and chair because that's large you know so okay. that that's part of the operational questions we have it's for instance if there's a wedding and there's a party downstairs for the wedding mm -hmm. is that is that everyone standing and therefore, 15 square feet isn't enough for a crowd like that. Right? Uh, I don't believe there's actually uh, parties held um, in the cellar. Mm -hmm. It is really just the service um, that would be held. I, I would ask members of yeah. the congregation to get up and speak to that yeah, yeah. Um, in, in one minute. Okay. Um, so, so regarding the occupancy load mm -hmm. for um, chairs that are not fixed, mm -hmm. it's usually like say on the first floor, uh -huh. it's usually seven square feet. I will and they use seven per person. Sure. So, and all of the plans say that DOB will determine the occupancy. But what if DOB says, well, seven square feet per person is more appropriate? So, is the architect here? Right? Uh, the architect couldn't make it today. But what I'd like to do is have them. I think they've actually reviewed the plans with the Department of Buildings on mm -hmm. the occupancy question. Okay. Um, we will submit in writing, um, you know, how the occupancy loads on each of the floors were calculated, and then, um, if need be, we can have the architect at the, the follow-up hearing. Right. I think you should bring the architect because it answers these kind of questions sure. that are really architect questions. Um, um, so, but and and just to clarify that, um, we need to know whether the architect actually did meet with DOB and whether there was some kind of a ZRD one or something like that issued in writing. Because when either you comply with the occupancy regulations for the for the use mm -hmm. and the occupancy that are listed in the code, yep. or you make a presentation to the buildings department. And then the department agrees on which occupancy load to choose. Understood. So, so if there was an agreement with DOB about using a different occupancy load, then it should be in writing. Understood. Right? Yep. Um, so on the building's first floor, the, the, the first through third floors will be um, used for, as male prayer hall. Um, and each floor, um, the floor plate is identical. Um, we'll have an entrance vestibule on that floor um, where individuals can either enter from the outside or exit from the elevator or stairwells. Um, the vestibule is used for um, members of the congregation to remove their shoes before entering the actual prayer service, uh, the prayer hall. Um, and there's some socialization that goes on before and after um, prayer services. Um, then uh, I believe a question had been uh, raised about the possibility of using a scissor stair. 
um, in order to increase efficiency. Um, I don't believe a scissor snare is permitted under the building code. Um, we have to have two separate um, means of egress and they have to be um, a significant distance apart. Um, so that, that uh, is why we have the, the two stairwells on each side of the building. Um, and then each floor has small offices. One of the offices is gonna be used by the congregation's imam for preparation of services. Um, one will be used by the, um, the, the congregation's clerical staff. Um, and then the, the third office is really going to be used to store um, texts, books, um, and serve as a meeting uh, room uh, or meeting office for one-on-one, -on -one, either religious uh, or personal um, instruction. Um, so what we can do is add some notes to the plans that just clarify the difference between and these the spaces. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One, uh, so some of the, the issues that have been raised by the community um, were uh, that there is significant noise, um, there's pedestrian uh, congestion, and I believe uh, actually both of those issues are going to be cured um, by the proposed uh, new structure. As I had mentioned before, currently congregants on Friday services and the high holidays have to pray outside. Speakers are put outside so that they can hear um, the prayer sermons. That's all going to be brought inside the building now. Um, we will no longer need to have members outside during services. Um, there's also some places inside um, for socialization before and after um, prayer services. Um, but I think that's also going to address some issues that members of the public had about um, pedestrian, uh, pedestrian congestion um, without having everybody congregated outside of the space on what is already a, a rather small property. Um, and they'll all be inside and should alleviate some of the congestion and maneuvering. About how many people would gather on a Friday night for the biggest Friday, service it's about, outside? Uh, uh, outside? Yeah, so yeah, it would be that. Right. Please state your name. Good afternoon. My name is Goranga Kundu. Thank you all. Uh, it's Friday, we have a two session, noon time. Mm -hmm. For every session, about 120 people. Mm -hmm. So two sessions, one session finish, they go, then another session comes over there. And those 120 are outside, or some of them are inside, some are outside? Some of them are inside, some of them are outside. About how much are outside? About uh, 30, 40 people are outside, about 80 people are inside. So now you would want to have one session with everybody inside? Inside, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And just out of curiosity, how does this actually work? You have all the, you have three different levels for men. How does, and the imam is only in on one floor unless you've got a lot of imams working at the same time. We, <laughs> we know the, the way imam prays, when he goes down, we go down. When he goes up, we know when he goes down by, you know. Just hearing it. But, by hearing this. Is there a TV screen? The, is there a, screen? Screen? Is there a yeah. loudspeaker We're not system? using the TV, we're using a, a, a microphone. So okay. the recording we hear from down, you know. Mm -hmm. So, because are there ever, for instance, sermons given where it's more than just the, the prayer, but there's a kind of a lecture given that everyone would want to hear? That would be on the speaker system? The speaker system. Yeah, okay. Okay, so then in terms of, that's why I wish the architect was here, but um, in terms of the sound from the speaker system, because it'll be broadcast on four floors, um, the issue that people who are walking by or live next door or whatever would hear the speaker from inside would, could be annoying to neighbors, right? So what we always ask for serious uh, insulation on the windows. So it means a more expensive window because you're using a higher uh, sound transmission level. Yeah, we, uh, I, okay. we, we consulted with architect Mm -hmm. using some rock sol acoustic insulation, the sound can be mitigated. Right, so it's not just the insulation in the walls, it's also the thickness. 
the, the way the windows are built. It's not really the thickness, it, it's it, how they it are built. Who will ask to design that window? That okay. sound can be mitigated. Yeah. Maybe, maybe how the architect, yeah. just Josh, <coughs> address that and yeah, yeah. to us. I think that would be helpful. We, the way we have talked in that. other yeah. ones um, that this STC rating is in like the 25 range. Mm -hmm. No, actually, do I have that back? Backwards, the STC rating is high and the DBA level is low, right? <coughs> I think it's like STC 58 or a number like that. Yeah. <coughs> Oftentimes we get specs on those windows yeah. in a detail. Yeah. We'll put the details in that. That'd be great. I think that, that's yeah. the. But there's not going to be any windows adjoining the residential. <coughs> oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, and then um, in terms of, so right now there are 200 people in the congregation, right, in total? Yes. That's a current situation. So when you started in the house that you're currently in, how many congregants did you have when you started? Like, what was that in 2000? Oh, when we started, about 75 congregants are there. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, neighbors are getting more people coming in, so there are more congregants. Okay, so if you calculated, now you have a new building and everyone's so happy because you have a new building and it's going to attract more people, right? Is, can you project what the actual, say, in five years, how many congregants you're going to have? The growth may be increased by three to five percent because density is very low. You cannot make a high rise building there. Mm -hmm. So expectations are very low mm -hmm. that not many people can get into that neighbor. Because mostly one, two family houses are there. So you're expecting to hold a 200 or go to 260? May, maybe 60, 50 would be there. Okay. okay. So the building has to be designed to handle it, otherwise you can't have 260, yeah, right? So you're, whatever you're, this is again a conversation with the architect, the occupancy loads and your desired congregation size has to match. That's regulated sure. by the buildings department, right? Okay. Um, and then another question. So do you have more questions about occupancy or anything in that line? No? no. Okay. So one of the things that um, was also with many of how the houses of worship, which is what you're experiencing right now from the neighbors, there are complaints about congregants spilling out onto the yards and kind of sort of spilling out onto neighbors' property. So we usually ask for fencing. Um, we will, we will put the fencing, uh, last architect to design fencing also. Mm -hmm. And we have two security when our, you know, uh, Friday and big holidays. So there are two security guys monitor mm -hmm. everything. And okay, so that's the other part of it. So you need monitors to make sure that people aren't like wandering around on other people's property. And also, and we'll get into this, to manage the double and triple parking of cars to the extent that there sure. is that, right? Okay. Yes. So, um, and usually with the fencing, because planting is both something that's attractive and it functions as a sound barrier, right? Yeah. So that you would also have dense hedging along the two lot lines that are, we that can, are adjacent. We, we can use some thermal pumps, insulations, so sound can be mitigated also. So, so there's two things that happen. The fence becomes a sound attenuation fence. Mm -hmm where there's actually product out there that's specifically for fencing. And then inside of it, you put hedges so that are, does, that are planted very close to each other. So it creates a dense buffer yes. between you and your neighbor and it well, to the deadens rear, the sound. At the there's rear, the first floor yeah. obstruction. There's a, there's oh yeah, the right floor. there. That, so and then can't go on the other, around. I mentioned yesterday how the cellar ceiling yeah structure comes up to grade so how are you going to plant things so that that's actually a great point and i raised that to the project architect um and they are looking at solutions as whether they're going to lower the portions of the there. ceiling and or of the, the cellar ceiling in order to provide enough soil for planting right um yeah. so that will be addressed in our follow-up submission okay that's good um, great and one other point that um mr kundu was starting to hint at um, and I believe 
addresses some of the issues that have been raised about parking um, is that the congregants membership really serves at, um, the immediate neighborhood um, and one of the reasons we don't we expect some modest growth I think three to five percent of the entire congregation um, but it is a single and two-family neighborhood and um, uh, most of the individuals uh, who are members walk to the facility. I, I believe um, between 85 to 90 percent of the congregants um, walk. Um, and so there is not a, a high demand for parking. Um, there are certainly some occasionally that are traveling from greater distances or somebody's dropping an elderly person off. Um, but um, recently the congregation has hired the two security guards to address um, the issues that have been raised with, with us at the community board, which were some blocking of driveways and double parking mm -hmm. um, to keep traffic moving through the area. So we have um, the two security guards on Friday services, um, which are the highest attended, and then uh, the high holidays, Ramadan. Mm -hmm. um, so we have those to help keep traffic moving, keep members from interfering or adversely impacting our neighbors. Um, and I think in our follow-up submission, uh, I was just provided with a, a comprehensive list of all the members and their addresses. So we're going to create a map that shows essentially the catchment area of the congregation and not identify individual members mm -hmm. by address, but right. pinpoint on that map where these individuals Correct. are coming from, well, similar to a city planning um, house of worship parking waiver. Well, well we've had it be in the past where an outline of the blocks where they're living. Yeah, you don't so have to you, show us so which that it's is just their house. very it's where they're at. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to know which is their house. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Great. Um, One other and question. also the reason that this came up was at another application similar to this one, and it may be different in this case. Um, we were given a little bit of. Um, background on what the sort of expectation of prayer is mm -hmm. in terms of the walk to to prayer like that they're they're actually in the other case which may again be completely different type mm -hmm. um, there was an expectation that prayer and walking are are linked actually okay. so maybe that doesn't happen here but if it does if you could expand on that Okay. Yes, and um, I think also, um, Chair, you had pointed out um, in one paragraph the differing times of the, mm -hmm, the yeah. services, and, and you're correct, they vary based on season, they vary based on sunset, and one set of right. times wasn't mm -hmm. updated, or updated um, statement of facts will reflect that. Right. Yeah, you could just give a range, you can say, you know, in the summer months it's from sure. this and to this period, and then that gives us an idea of when people would be coming. Okay. Um, is there any plan to use the roof for any purpose? There is no plan to use the roof other uh, than get up there for maintenance. Okay, so I'm not sure I don't, I don't know if you need two means of egress to the roof. I, I Just think that the, the fire department requires a staircase to always go to the roof for the fire department to do with ladders. No, because the people may be egressing because the okay. fire's on the first floor, they may egress to the I, roof. Because I know the person to the rear sent us a letter saying that they're concerned about the height and how it's going to change their their light mm -hmm. <laughs> so um i noticed that the rear stairway bulkhead i believe is twice as wide as it needs to be because it's like you have another stair going up further yeah, um i'll have trash. i'll have the architect look at both of those issues whether we need to extend the bulkhead to uh, you know, those the bulkheads level, yeah um and the size Right. Um, and also, you know, I actually don't know if we see the bulkhead expressed fully, right? So, you know, the, the, yeah, it is actually. So the, the bulkhead could be reduced in mass because you don't actually need it to be a big block it can be following the slope of the staircase. Um, so maybe okay. there's a way to reduce that back bulkhead. Um, and then the one that holds up the dome. That's just that's just support for the dome. That's not a bulkhead. Actually, both bulkheads could probably be reduced. Yes. You know, that's the other thing we sometimes see where the there's no advantage taken um, in the bulkhead as part of the of a design element. That 
bulk, both that bulkhead, actually both bulkheads, the elevator and the stair, come to the front of the building and it, they're not revealed in any kind of design element, so it's just going to be this box on the front. Meanwhile, there's so much control with the minarets, you would mm -hmm. think that this would become part of the design feature. I think the architect should look more carefully at how the clarity of the minarets are going to be ruined by being adjacent to bulkheads or competing with bulkheads. Um, and can you put the measurements on the, the plans of all of the permitted obstructions? Ex yeah. Exactly. So but in addition to that, I think a question <coughs> was um, we wanted the height and setback diagram shown yes. on the section drawing right. and the elevation. Essentially, we're permitted three stories or 35 feet at the front yard line at which point um, the sky exposure plane um, yes. takes over. Uh, our entire building height is below that, that maximum permitted. To the uh, roof, but not to the dome mm -hmm. and the Correct, minarets. and those are per permitted obstructions. Careful, so we, on the last one, we found out that the Department of Buildings does not consider a dome, don't know why, a permitted obstruction right. like a steeple. And since we don't want to split hairs about whether a minaret is a steeple and you're here before the BSA, I would just put the whole thing in, right? That yeah. the minaret and the domes part are part, can may part not be permitted obstructions, therefore, right? I think they can be part of the waiver. It's yeah. just because simpler to do. They, they had here. in the other project a problem with the dome. Okay, so just to clarify, the, the minarets, the dome are n not permitted obstructions, so... In, in ca yeah, for instance, we're not going to treat them as permitted obstructions. We'll treat them as something that gets waived by the height and setback regulations. That'll make it easier for you at DOB. So it's if permitted by DOB, or if approved by DOB? No. No, no, no. We, we already wave. know they that the dome, yeah, they the don't dome consider they, they, a permitted they, obstruction. They, oh, they yeah. had that problem at the uh, last yeah. application. That was a Queen's project too. Yeah. So the right. And the minaret, it, the minaret it, that building didn't have a minaret, so actually we didn't Yeah, we didn't have to address find that, out whether that's also a steeple, though you would think okay. it's a steeple. I, yeah, yeah, I think it, <laughs> it should be a permitted objection. <laughs> uh, yeah, well uh, no, I think they already have a height objection, right? No. Yeah, they have uh, a you have no, you don't have a height objection. No, we do not. Right now oh, all right. we have so are yards. yard waivers. Well so you so here's so here's the thing. Because you would need an objection for this, and we also want to know for sure what your occupancy rate is, mm -hmm. um, maybe that's an opportunity to go to DOB and clarify Both once issues. and for all in writing what the occupancy class is for the... And if they consider those elements permitted obstructions, yeah, that's fine, fine, fine too. That's fine. We're yeah. fine with that. Yeah, <laughs> it's just that we had that experience yeah. and it delayed yeah. that yeah. project. Yeah, by I don't appreciate that being yeah. pointed out now because I don't want to have to. Yeah, yeah. There. yeah. yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. Also, I, in addition to the height and setback diagrams, um, which we will label accordingly based on our um, DOB meetings, I know um, some requests were made for. Uh, exterior finishing details. Um, we'll add those notes to the plan. Just for your knowledge, it's going to be essentially a slab rock exterior face with stucco around the, the windows. Um, but we'll have those um, materials actually added to so the So it's going to be an actual stone facing? Yeah, stone facing. It may not be like an actual thick stone no, versus so just a veneer. But just okay. checking it's not one of those styrofoam things. No. That, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> no styrofoam on the mosque. I have a question. Are, are there separate men's and women's entrances? No. Oh, there are? Uh, no, they are able to come through the, the same okay. entrance. Women are able to use the elevator. Um, they just, prayers have to be mm -hmm. separate. And then this is more for my education because there are so many different ways of interpreting mosques. There's no area for foot washing. Is that not something that's part of the... Isn't that downstairs? Yeah, there's, there's, there's an ablution room in the... Cellar. In the Two. cellar? Yeah. Oh, there is? There's okay. A for men's and yes. Similar to where we've seen it before. Yeah. No, okay. We saw it split, I think. Yeah. Okay. One. So, okay. And then, um, what was my other question? I guess, I can't remember. Okay. <laughs>
Let's see, are there any other um, I have questions about the plans and in terms of the as of right and the um, lesser variance that the seller in both of those should be the same as the seller in your proposed Understood. and then yep. correct your numbers in your statement to yep. match that. Mm -hmm. I already got that comment that's been communicated to the architect. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, any other question, comments? Uh, I just wanted to, there was a discussion yesterday about sort of tightening up some of the, the rooms, but what I heard from this testimony was that the vestibule actually serves as the yes. kind of purpose that is, mm -hmm. is uh, sort of essential to the program. Yes. So I, I mm -hmm. that, Right, I, yeah. and I also have to say that it seems that um, by, say, designing the building or being so flexible in the design that prayer rooms could be on multi floors we don't see that that often yeah, yeah, right and really what that's enabling economical. is what i think of as a much more sensitive design to the neighborhood because it's pulling back on on yards even though it's not complying it's still pulling back on yards where we often see no provision oh. for a yard so the idea of being willing to have multiple levels and that still works programmatically, I think is really great um, and, and sensitive. Um, okay, are there any speakers on this? No? <coughs> so, okay. When some, yeah, they have a pretty clear yeah. sense of what you guys need to do, but I don't know how long the it will take. comments yesterday were comprehensive and, mm -hmm. and we're already started addressing some, most of them. Oh, oh, sorry, left out one thing, sorry. Sure. Um, there was one of the complaints was about the current operations where there's trash issues. Oh, right. um, And so you, you do have a kitchen, um, and trash is a big issue a lot of the times on these kinds of houses of worship. So we, to the extent that there is going to be catering and there's an issue with trash, it's one of two things. If there's going to be catering, therefore food waste, then we need a refrigerated interior trash storage area. If the, if the kind of trash is more whatever, then it just needs to be an interior trash storage area and trash only comes out right before pickup, which is by sanitation, right? And it will be an enclosed area, so it will not be exposed. Okay, so it'll be on the interior of the building and it's only brought out right before pickup, whichever days of the week that is, right? Okay. So you have a trash room. Yeah, and we'll make sure that on any revised plans that that is clearly delineated. Yeah. Okay. But just to be clear, so in that room, in the cellar, the room that functions as a multi-purpose room, um, is food served sometimes for events? Yes. Okay, so then how does that work? Is the food prepared on site or is it catered? Food, food prepares um, in that building sometimes, not much, a little bit and then it serves in the cellars. And then it's served in the cellar there. Okay, so because food is prepared on site, that's where the trash disposal is a problem because the food sits there, just develops its own life. <laughs> so that's why we want a refrigerated trash storage area. So um, what you could do is um, there are calculations where you can figure, based on your own experience right now, how much trash you generate, and you can calculate how big of a refrigeration room you need. It can be something quite small because often it's compacted, right? So, but it, there is a, an official method of calculating that which you need to do, okay? Based on the number of participants at an event, okay? All right. Um, what are we saying then? How much time? I don't think we have, do we have any room on July 25th? Uh, I have 17 cases we can oh, put this fine. on. Okay, yeah. July, tw and that's including the ones you added? Yes. Okay. July 25 then, if that's enough time, mm -hmm. would uh, be a submission on July 5th. Not sure if you're doing anything. <laughs> I will be away, but I'll ensure it's done beforehand. Okay, so that only gives you basically a month and a little bit to respond. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? 
Yes. Okay. okay. Just speaking on behalf of the architect who's not here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure it's enough for him. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye. Right. Take care. Good to see you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Item number four, 2016, 4251 BC, 626 Sheepshead Bay Road, Brooklyn. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Ethan Goodman with Fox Rothschild, representing Neptune South Commercial LLC. Just a couple of lost to the boards. Um, so yeah, we're here for a 7344 parking reduction. Um, we attended review session yesterday, heard a few of your comments. In addition, we attended review session uh, last time around when we were adjourned it, and you had some comments. We responded to all those in writing. Um, I think one of your comments was had a little bit to do with um, with uh, what uses are in this building and how we did the parking, um, as well as sort of two buildings versus one building. I think maybe it's worth uh, just be just taking a quick walk through what the project is and how it comes together. Um, so it's 109,000 square foot, a seven-story building. Uh, the second story is parking entirely, so it's six stories of floor area. Uh, you'll see in the picture. Um, that you'll have the main seven-story building. And then there's what looks like a wing, which is that one-story wing. It's retail with parking on the roof. It's a roof of a basement. Um, that wing is a separate, uh, it's a separate tax lot. It is a separate zoning lot, and it is a separate building. Um, and the reason for that uh, originates uh, about, I don't know, probably about a year and a half ago. Um, the applicant owns 626 Sheepshead Bay, which is, uh, which is lot eight. Uh, where the seven-story building is going. The applicant does not own Lot 1. The applicant is under a long-term 49-year lease for Lot 1. Because of that, the Department of Buildings insisted that this would be built as two separate buildings, not one building, um, and so they wanted us to build two buildings. Uh, so we had to meet certain requirements for two buildings. Uh, we were allowed by the DOB to, um, to share some systems and services, to not share all systems and services, specifically, um, Loading is provided off of West 8th Street on the one-story portion. Uh, the parking egress and access is through a ramp on the seven-story portion into both the one-story roof and the second story of the seven stories. Um, gas service and HVAC is provided in the seven-story building on the rooftop and in, with a shared meter room in the basement. All of these are documented via um, uh, easements between the two buildings uh, that are in perpetuity and make sure that these systems have to be shared. There are, oh, and finally, a party wall. There's a party wall. It's a firewall between the two buildings um, that split up the two buildings. Um, with How does the firewall split up the two buildings? It's a, it's a, fire, it's a shared firewall uh, right on the first floor. It's right here, just on the first floor. What about the second floor? Um, no, there's only one floor on this building, right? So The basement. So the, the basement. Yeah, it goes, the basement. Right, it, it, it goes all the way, all the way down. There's a very limited basement. It's about 3,000 square feet. And it's predominantly in this building. I don't think there's actually much excavation in the basement of this building. Um, and so the, the wall is separating the two, and we're limited to the permitted openings between the two. But so this thing that's on top of the basement level, which would be considered the roof. Uh, sorry, yes. Right? There is a basement. The, 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 the first floor from grade is a basement because it is, it is uh, slightly below the mean right. curve. And DOB is treating the floor above the basement as where the parking sits as a roof? Uh, well, it's, it's only a roof because it's the top of every building is a roof. But you are allowed to park on the roof because you're parking on a basement roof. Right, but right. so I'm still in the, what about the firewall between the roof of the building? There's always a parapet wall where the party wall continues up and functions as a fire stop from one building to the other. That's the part I'm not understanding. You're talking about the, how did you be treat the rooftop separation in the parking facility? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can let the architect comment on that. Yeah. I don't know the specific on that one. Sure. Please state your name for the record. Yes. Hello, my name is Haik Arustamian. And uh, by code, because of the type of the construction, that party will be allowed to stop under Could the you move closer to the mic? Yeah. <clears throat> There's an exception in a code where we can stop the firewall under the roof. Of what? Those two what? Can you can you tell us what that is? I don't know. Can you I, give yeah, um, council a yes. copy of that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
very confusing. I'm looking for the definition of building, and I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do with ownership. <laughs> no, the definition of building does not. We would actually might have preferred to have it be one building. DOB did not, would, would not, that was not an acceptable uh, Based on situation. ownership. Based on ownership, the, the idea is once the 49 year lease runs out on half of a building, if they were to call it one building, then they've got a situation where you've got, you've got one basically, I mean, look, they, it, it derives from the fact that they, they don't let you merge the tax lot into one tax lot because it's multiple different owners. And they don't want to have a building span across tax lot lines. The definition of a building says it's bounded by open area or firewalls. Mm -hmm. And it is. It's the rooftop that, right, the, 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 the edge of the roof doesn't have a wall that's separating the two from the other building. Uh, but the building itself, the, ones, the one story of that building, is indeed separated by a firewall. So it's really interesting because, I mean, I don't know how relevant it is. Assessors will initiate a merger when it appears as if one building is going across two tax lots, and they that, don't that, even check ownership. That, they just automatically process a merger application. Which, which affirms the fact that they would not allow us to build one building across two tax lots. Right. They would also not let us merge these tax lots because of the ownership situation where we did not own in perpetuity the one-story structure. But I think to Commissioner Otley Brown's point, an assessor walking in the neighborhood will say, oh, look, there's one building on this right. lot. There is nothing for you to <laughs> use to say this is two buildings, because when I drive to park, I'm going over there and I'm parking over there. Sure, but it's okay. all documented through DOB. There is two separate building permits. It's two separate CFOs. It's two separate, uh, it's two two separate sign offs. There are cross easements that, that explain all the shared services. Right, and it, I'm just not sure that the assessors are actually getting that information. That's all I'm saying is that that's why I'm really puzzled by this because the assessor is just going to process a merger. Mm -hmm. They're going to initiate a merger because it's, it's finance policy, at least it used to be finance policy, that you could not have one building spanning two tax lots mm -hmm. and what will appear to them to be one building because it is one access to the parking and so they're not going to they're not going to investigate the ownership situation. That's my thought, but that's not, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, it's not something of you. We should be aware of that, issue. certainly. Yeah, just be aware of it, because I think it's something probably that buildings and finance have to talk about, mm -hmm. because it seems like they both have different policies yeah. that are going to clash in Good. certain situations. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> Super confusing and weird. All right. <laughs> So, so that was with respect to the, the concept of one building versus two. Mm -hmm. um, also a question came up as to um, this use group for a community facility space. Could I right? ask one more question sure. or one more, uh, mm -hmm. regarding the building on lot one? It seems that you have different clearances to the parapet wall building that you don't have on the other lot. Is there a reason for that? Clearances, I'm not sure if I understand. There's a six-foot clearance to the parapet wall along the main, I forget the name of that street. Y yeah, this is West, so we have, we have West 8th and Sheets at Bay Road. Right. Both of those streets have a, a separation between where the parking is allowed and the parapet wall. But there is no okay. separation on the other lot. I mean, I'll, I'll see if the architect understands it better than I do. What's the question? I'm looking at um, parking floor plan six of fourteen. The sheet. Yes. And if you look at lot one, you have these six foot. Right, because they're facing straight, and this is adjacent property, so these are this articulated fins. Can you, sorry, can you take the mic with you, oh, otherwise the speakers can't hear you. So these <coughs> fins are screening the parking from the street, and on the back along this, you only have this adjacent building, so therefore it's just a regular carpet. But I think she's asking me why. Yeah, but how come you don't have to, re, you right. know, continue that six why foot here? separation here from the this? parapet wall along the rest of the parking lot? 
Well, it's continuing from a lot. It's facing the two streets. According to your plans. I just thought it looked like there was something different about the parking layout on Lot Oh, that's because it's a fire department access. It's not required from the street. Oh. That's a, that's, fire yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a required. Yeah. Yeah. There's a fire department yeah. access requirements. We have to provide, demonstrate. There is okay, a landing so space for them. And then there's a route. That right, and there's a route okay. in between, yes. Okay, that, that mm. okay, thank okay. you. Um. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah, I could, I could talk a little bit about community facility use. Mm -hmm. um, and this ties into the, the, um, the parking demand study. Um, our, our parking traffic consultant, environmental consultant, uh, Philip Habib, from Philip Habib Associates is here. Um, but just to, to give you a brief overview. So the way the, the uses break down on the site, this is a site, it's a CA2, and it's a 4.8 FAR, maximum FAR for community facility use. It is a 2 FAR maximum for commercial uses. Um, and so the way the site breaks down is there is essentially one floor of, uh, of retail use, one, uh, a little bit more than one floor of commercial office use, totaling that two FAR. Anything above and beyond that must be a use group for community facility use, because obviously we don't have the FAR. Uh, the way those, that community facility use breaks down is a certain portion of that is another one floor is, um, is ambulatory care which has a certain parking ratio. And the remainder, which is two floors at about 36,000 square feet, is a use group 4A, it, you know, it, our drawings call it a use group 4A community facility, uh, uh, not-for-profit without sleeping accommodations use. Uh, it may indeed, it is most likely to be that in the end. There are a number of uses in 4A that are community facility uses that have the same parking requirement, parking ratio of, of one space per 20 rated capacity. Um, so while, based on the tenants we're talking to, it's most likely to be a use group for a not-for-profit without sleeping accommodations, um, there are other uses such as community centers, welfare centers, clubs, recreation centers, that, that in theory it could be without changing any parking requirement. For the purposes of the traffic analysis, or the parking demand study, um, the use group for a uh, text for not-for-profit without sleeping does allow a certain portion of that uh, square footage be used for central office functions. What you would typically find elsewhere in a typical office. Cubicles, people office. Um, and the idea was that DOB wanted to prevent you from just having a not-for-profit, but just having their back offices be located in a place. They said, that's not not-for-profit, that's office. Um, there is a standard in that section that does cap it at 25,000 square feet. Um, we believe uh, the sort of, the way DOB is most likely to review that is that this back office function, which indeed is limited to 25,000 or 50 people, it is intended to be viewed as essentially accessory to the not-for-profit service providing space, the community facility. And therefore, we think it would be more likely that they would see, they would want to see a space that has some central office to be predominantly not-for-profit service providing space, not office. So that's why initially in the review, we split it up 50-50. We have 37,000 square foot of this community facility, not for profit, without sleeping. Um, and we split it up at about, it's about 18 and 18. 18 uh, more traditional office, which generates more trips, and 18 of this service providing space. Upon resp uh, response to some comments uh, from the board, we upped that to the full 25,000 square feet of space. Uh, because, well, look, if DOB allowed you to go to the full 25, then maybe in theory you could. That increased the parking demand. Um, we still have about a 15 space buffer, but now we have that 38,000 square feet of space. We've maxed out the quote unquote office, or the not a quote unquote office, and the residual is essentially community center 13,000 square feet, which has a much lower parking demand. Okay, but so this mysterious not for profit without sleeping accommodations, uh -huh. there are so many different kinds, mm -hmm. many of which do what they do effectively with office space, which is not administrative space. It's where, for instance, the caseworkers sit when they're meeting mm -hmm. with clients because they're social workers, and that's not the same thing as ambulatory diagnostic, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they have as many cubicles as you might have if it were all administrative office. So mm -hmm. we, we don't, at this point, that's why we kept asking, what kind of a not-for-profit without sleeping accommodations mm -hmm. because so far all I'm imagining unless it's a 
not-for-profit dance company or um, a not-for-profit right. museum, I'm trying to imagine what else would go on there where they're not effectively offices. Uh -huh. So obviously you're right, wide variety of not-for-profit, um, wide, wide variety of service providers. Uh, some, let me just, I'll toss out a few of the, I, and I don't, there are no leases signed, but a, a few of the types of uses that have shown interest and then there have been discussions around. Um, there have been discussions around uses such as adult daycare uses that would not be ambulatory uh, treatment facilities. Um, food stamp administration offices and service providing. Um, so in, the, in a lot of these cases, yes, you've got offices, but you've also got central areas where people are sort of in the front area. Um, after school programs, things like that. Um, uh, some discussions with the state office of, uh, of people with developmental disabilities, right, as a service providing center for them. Um, I think all these uses certainly do have a certain degree of, of office type uses, but they'd also have a, a, a good amount of uses where people would come into the front door, central areas where you wait, um, areas where people, yes, in some instances you come back to the provider's office cubicle in some areas it's a separate area where you go sit you go and sit and you you have a consultation that's in sort of a separate area I um, I don't think uh, well you know it's I don't want to speak on behalf of DOB uh, but I think the concept of in that area of was central office functions being the 25 limits to 25,000 is that they didn't want to see a floor plan that looked like an office, a, a, a straight up office. Um, there needed to be, I, I, I am anticipating that, that, that these, these would have to be consultation areas, would have to be consultation rooms, would have to be waiting rooms, things like that. Right. Um, we think the study as it was done currently, it, again, it's, it's, a, it's two thirds office, and there's one third of the space that's remaining that is, was viewed as non-office. Right. Um, but so we, so we were looking at like the reasonable worst case scenario kind of idea. So if we just assumed, and um, most of the time that we get these applications of which we see quite a lot, it's a combination of two uses. It's ambulatory care and standard use group 6A offices. Mm -hmm. And they're both, the traffic and parking is run based on those two uses. Mm -hmm. And we don't know, you know, ambulatory care, which is a very high traffic parking demand or traffic demand use, the office space, use group 6B um, office space, could easily be also doctor's offices because they're professional offices, right? So that ambulatory care actually could have expanded throughout the building, but we don't ask for that worst case scenario mm -hmm. to be run because maybe it becomes law offices, right? So in this situation, if we just sort of assume the same kind of a mix, offices and ambulatory care, then at least we'll have taken it to a reasonable worst case as opposed to an expectation of some type of function in your not-for-profit mm -hmm. that is, you know, for instance, if you were doing an after-school program, you potentially have hundreds of kids coming in, all arriving in buses, and I don't know what, but we don't need to look at every single possibility, just one that's reasonable, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I'm thinking, and based on our discussions, that the numbers should be run assuming the entire not-for-profit space is, is an office. That'll increase slightly, I think, your demand but I don't think it'll exceed what you're providing. Mm -hmm. It'll just make us feel like at least it's not such an unknown in that not-for-profit mm -hmm. area. So even, and, I, and in the end, I, it may be semantics because I, I don't think it, I think we would still be under the number of spots we're providing. Um, it would seem a little odd to take the entire 36,000 and treat it exactly the same as an office because you would say there, there is an interaction with the public that would require at least some of the space to, it can't all be office just like a, a law office. I mean, some of it has to be receiving area and waiting area law and things like that. Law conference centers, so you can't compare it to okay. a law firm. As you know, right. whole floors devoted only to a few, con to conference rooms right. where 12 people sit and eat a lot of food. So. <laughs> right. I, I, look, I think we can run that analysis. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't, I think we've, we've done a preliminary look and just looking at the chart as to what how much each use generates, mm -hmm. back of the envelope, would seem to indicate we'd still be okay if we ran right. that extra 13,000, as okay. in 
office type use, yes. Right, okay. Good, all right, and then I think since you need to do that, there was also a question about the lighting. Yes, yes. Um, and so there's, I guess, two components of the lighting. The image on the left might show you that sort of the open rooftop a little bit better. So there's headlights and there's lighting of the deck, right? The headlights, we have a six foot, uh, a six foot aluminum screen. It's, a, it's an angled slatted screen. Um, and you see them on other garages. It's intended so that uh, perpendicular lights do not, ex do not emerge from it. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest concern is obviously, yes, on the right, the residence is there. So it's, it's that western frontage there. It's angled slatted all around to prevent um, headlights. As far as the, the lighting of the actual deck, the lighting that's proposed is merely down lighting on the two bulkheads. I'll just point them out right here. So there's a bulkhead here and a bulkhead here. There would be affixed to that bulkhead itself. Uh, there would be down lighting, LED down lighting, that would be up, uh, buffered on the side so it's not uh, unconstrained moving outward. Uh, we have a spec sheet on that. We can provide that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's a very subtle lighting scheme. Okay, so if you could show the lighting on the plans and then also provide the spec sheet. Mm -hmm. okay. We'll do. Yep. All right. Are there any speakers on this? Okay. So I think we're talking July 20, whatever we said, 25th, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Put this on there. So then I think we could ideally, as long as the numbers work with the parking, mm -hmm. the, we could put this on for July 25th and we could do a decision on that date as well, assuming Great. everything works. Okay? Great. With, this, with the submission date of? With the submission date of July 5th. Okay. That works. Okay. Good. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. You. This concludes the public hearing for July, July. No. May 23rd, 2017. <laughs>